while you're standing, let's go to, uh, while you're standing, let's go to Psalms chapter 67, verses 1 and 2. Psalms, the 67th chapter, and verses 1 and 2. We'll read that and then let you be seated. We'll launch into part three of More Than Enough. God, be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us. Is that your prayer? Selah. Verse two, that thy way may be known upon the earth. See, there's a purpose. God don't bless you just because he wants you to be a fat cat. Just because he wants you to be rich. There's a purpose. You're blessed to be a blessing. And so he blesses you so that thy way may be known upon the earth and thy saving health among the nations. Bless me that I can be a testimony to others of what a great God I serve. Hallelujah. This is more than enough part three. You can be seated. Lift your hands and ask the Holy Ghost to talk to your heart tonight. Would you do that? Ask the Holy Ghost to speak to you in this place. In the precious name of Jesus, we need the mercy and the blessing of God in this house tonight. In Jesus' blessed holy name. Now, if you're here tonight and you did not hear more than enough part one, more than enough part two, then tonight we'll leave you behind. Uh, you need to go back uh, on YouTube and listen to more than enough part one and part two so that you will have a basis for part three. That doesn't mean you have to get up and leave tonight. You can't hear what I'm going to teach. It just simply means that you'll have a better understanding of tonight if you'll listen to the first two. In part one, we established the difference between riches and prosperity. Very important that you understand that riches is selfish. Riches is uh, for you. Riches means that um, you're supplying it. You're getting it however you can get it and grab it and hold it. Prosperity, on the other hand, is the gift of God. Prosperity is the gift of God. You didn't get it on your own. God gave it to you. And God is an abundant supplier. God is an abundant supplier. He's never lacking. He always has more than enough. Um, and so we establish that prosperity comes from God. Riches comes from our own ingenuity. Riches is to keep. Prosperity is to give. Riches stops the flow and stagnates. Prosperity loves to flow. Real sp prosperity is defined by how much you give away, not how much you keep. Because with riches, you have to hold on because there may not be any more. But with prosperity, we know that it comes from an abundance, and the more it flows out, the more that flows in. Three things that has to be established in order for prosperity to come in your life and in your world. It's built on a foundation. There has to be a foundation to it. God don't just pour prosperity out in your front yard. You have to have a fun foundation in which prosperity will be built upon. That foundation is number one, stewardship, number two, generosity, and number three, faith in God's provision. 
actually I said them backwards. The pad is faith in God's provision, and upon faith in God's provision must be generosity and stewardship. So that is the summation of part one. Part two of more than enough was the fact that everything I have belongs to God. I'm just a steward of it. I've got to say that again because I didn't think you get it. Got it. Everything that I have is God's. My thought processes, my mentality, uh, my mental acumen, my dexterity, uh, the fact that I've got a mind to have a business, all is the gift of God. And he gave me all that that I might be a good steward of the things that he entrusts me with. What does that mean? That means the property that you own and that you live on didn't originate with you. Somebody owned it before you got it. And guess what? They pro the reason you have it is because somebody died. And they couldn't take it with them. And one of these days you're going to die. And you're not going to take it with you. And that property, if God tarries, will be transferred into someone else's hands. So what that means is it's not yours. You're just borrowing it while you're alive. Hallelujah. And if you'll be a good steward of it, and if you'll believe it is God's and not yours, God, because of your stewardship, will open up the windows of heaven and pour blessings out upon you that is beyond what you're able to comprehend or receive. Hallelujah. And the best way to have more and more and more and more and more so that you can give and give and give and give and give and continue to be a blessing is to understand that you're only a steward of what comes through your hands. It's easy to give if you understand it's not yours and there's more coming where that came from. Very hard to give. If in your mind and in your thought processes, this is mine. And I may never get any more. So I've got to make the most of what I have. When you view it as God's and you're a steward of it, it brings joy and peace into your life and your world. Because you believe you're serving an abundant father. But when you believe it's yours and you've got to do your own ingenuity and you may not be able to lay your hands on any more, then it will rob you of peace. And you will become a miser and a scrooge. And people will get the wrong image of the God that you serve. So that is the summation of part two. Now let's go to part three. Brother Cody... Col Colby Frederick, good to see you here tonight. We usually have you up to greet the congregation. I didn't realize you, well, I did realize you were, were here in the prayer room, but I didn't lead the service tonight. And uh, Brother, uh, I'm sure that Brother Cody Thrash just missed it. There was no disrespect. We're honored that you're here. Full-time evangelist out of this church, and we're honored to have Brother Colby Frederick with us tonight. I need, um, I need help tonight. I need Brother um, Matt Davidson, would you help me tonight? Uh, I have a ladder and a sack of ropes in the, in the conference room that I need on this platform. And um, we're going to use that tonight uh, for part three of more than enough. More than enough, part three. Are you ready to go? Let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14. Matthew the 20, I'm sorry, 25th chapter. Matthew chapter 25, and we want to read verse 14 through verse 30. Brother Jason Davidson, would you come and read 25, 14 through 30 for them while I set up my illustration tonight for this 
message. Matthew 25, verses 14 through 30. If you could read that for us, please. Not only will he be reading it and you'll be hearing it, but you'll also be reading it off the screen. So please pay, pay close attention to this old parable tonight because it's an anchor point to what I'm going to teach tonight on More Than Enough Part 3. Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents. Done. Good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness." There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What this tells you is that Jesus was not a socialist. I got to say that again because I think some of y'all missed it. Jesus was not a socialist. He said, if you wasted what you had and you didn't use it wisely and you wasn't a good steward... I'm not going to send you down to the welfare office to sign up for aid. I'm going to take away what you had, and I'm going to give it to someone that will make something out of it. Now, you've got to be careful with this deal of giving to the poor. Because I believe in giving to the poor. I don't believe in giving to the poor by design. Did, did you miss what I just said? I don't believe in giving to the poor who are poor by design. I, 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 I'm, I don't mean to be hard or cruel, but I never give money 
to someone running around in an intersection with a sign in the middle of the heat gathering money. Because if they can run back and forth and run to those cars with a sign and get money out of cars and wave and laugh, thank you, thank you, thank you, and stand out there in the hot sun all day, they can take them a shovel and say, thank you, thank you, thank you that I have a job and dig a ditch. They're, not, they're poor by design. Am, am I making sense to you? The, the deal is, is everyone temporarily falls on hard times. There's not a one of us that's in this building tonight that not, have not had a time that we needed someone to help us. At some point in your life, you needed someone to help you. Uh, my uncle used to say all the time, Brother Steve McMullen used to say all the time, if you ever are driving down the road and you see a turtle on top of a fence post, you don't have to wonder if he got there by himself. I can assure you someone picked him up and put him there. And most of us did not get where we are by ourselves. Someone picked us up. Someone paid for college. Someone took you under their wing and taught you a trade. Someone did something that gave you a little bit of an unfair advantage. How many of you can admit that tonight? Somebody took an interest in you. That, listen to me, that is giving to the poor. Giving to the poor that keeps them poor is not God's design. You've got to give to the poor in such a way that it helps them to be poor no more. Not give to the poor in a way that makes them a victim. Am I making sense to you? You can't give to the poor in a way that victimizes people. If you give to the poor in such a way that keeps them poor then you have, you have not helped them, you have hurt them. Now, I, I, I pray that you hear what I'm saying to you right now. See, a government check that somebody goes down and gets every month victimizes that individual. It, it, it's the sa same thing as giving someone cocaine. They're, they're never going to think of a day that they don't need that check. If they get a, let me tell you, once you get someone going down and getting a free check at the government every month, it doesn't matter if they get a sideline that's getting them 10000 a month in cash. They're going to hide it and go get that check. Am I making sense to you? You have just made them a victim. They're victimized. They'll never see a day that they say, you know, I don't think I need that check anymore. The, the purpose in giving to the poor is to help that person through a temporary situation that gets them on their feet, not on their back. Because they're not classified, when you get done with them, if you, if you treat it like socialism, when you get done with them, they're not poor anymore. They're a victim now. I'm, I'm, and somebody said, well, what's the problem with that? The problem with that, every, every, everybody listen to me. The problem with that is where the United States is right now. And that is the fact that we're at the breaking point that we have got more people taking checks from the government than we got people paying taxes to the government. 
And we're in trouble. Because here's the problem. Once they're getting a check from the government, they will never vote Republican again. They're going to keep whoever's in there, going to keep them checks going. Well, the minute that you've got 60% of your constituents receiving checks, and you've got 40% paying taxes in, you are on a collision course with disaster. And somebody said, well, I'm going to keep voting where we can, we can get that check. Well, just keep doing it because it, it's going to be over anyway. If you don't vote in to stop it, it's going to be stopped when the nation goes bankrupt. And we're right now at a point, I want everybody here to listen to me. This is not a political speech. But Jesus was not a socialist. He was a capitalist. He's the one that anointed Paul to write that if a man won't work, he should not eat. Don't feed him if he won't work. Now, if there's some reason why he can't work, if there's some reason why he worked real hard, but he, he, had, a, he had a bad time and we're getting him through it, then feed him. But if he's not working by design because he's lazy, you don't give him a meal. You tell him to get off his duff and go get him a job. Because it can only go so long. And then you're on a collision course with disaster. Am I making sense to y'all tonight? And so you, you I, I don't mean to be mean or unkind, but let me just give you some advice. If you want to keep this nation going in the direction that's going right now, then I would strongly advise you to learn Chinese or Russian. Because in your very near future, you're going to need one of the two. Because they're going to own us. Because it can't continue the way that it's going right now. If we don't have a major turnaround. If we don't have a major turnaround. And, and th this is, th again, this is by design. The powers that be have invested billions of dollars into China. And the flow across the southern border is for the purpose of breaking this nation. Okay, because we are, we are borrowing billions and billions, maybe even trillions of dollars from China to sustain the flow of people that are on the government dole. Now, now listen to me because th this is important to my message. So we're borrowing money from China to support all the people that's getting government checks. And so you flood millions across the border that automatically become a, a part of the government support until the government can't support itself anymore. And then you finally say, well, we surrender to you, China. You own us. And all the people that's involved in Chinese companies become multi-billionaires because they invested in the government See, that's what's happening is you've got government officials right now that's got, they're betting that China's going to win and we're going to fail. So why put their money in the failing system? And that's, and that, that's what's happening to, to your nation right now. And it all comes back to just what I'm talking about right here. 
Jesus was not a socialist. All this deal of giving to the poor, giving to the poor, giving to the poor, giving to the poor to an Israelite, to a person in Israel, meant different than giving to the poor in the United States of America. Giving to the poor in the United States of America becomes giving people money so they can afford cigarettes and crystal meth. Paying their light bill because they're spending all their money on alcohol and crystal meth and cigarettes. That's not giving to the poor. That's supporting sin. That's supporting destruction. That's supporting someone that's destroying themselves. You don't give money to someone that has an addiction. You don't give money to someone that has an addiction. If they have an addiction and you're giving them money, why don't you just shoot them? It ends their misery quicker. Well, I don't give them money. I pay their light bill. It's the same thing. You pay their light bill so they can afford more crystal meth. <laughs> You're perpetuating insanity. You're making them worse and worse. Am I making sense to you right now? You've got to define what does giving to the poor mean. It doesn't mean giving money to people that's got enough money to buy cigarettes but they don't have enough money to pay their electric bill. It doesn't mean giving money to someone that's an alcoholic because they don't have gas to put in their car at the gas station. But you walk over to give them $20 and look in the back of their floorboard and there's 16 beer cans back, back, stacked up back there. They're poor by design. It, it, they're not poor. They have a chosen lifestyle. You know, that, that's altogether different from someone that works a job, works hard, has four kids, you know, gets a nail through his foot on the job and can't work for a few weeks, and you give him... Uh, $500 to help him through a hard time. That's giving to the poor. Am I making sense to anyone here? What we've done is we've broadened the, the scope of poor to anyone that, anyone that needs $20 right at the moment. And, and you can literally sow seed into bad ground. You know, I, I, I had a situation, I was telling my dad about it the other day, where I, I, I ran into a guy in a restaurant, outside a restaurant, talking about how hungry he was. And so I went into the restaurant and bought him a hamburger and some french fries and a drink and brought it out there to him and he cursed me for everything he, I was worth. and said, I don't want that food. I want that money. See, he wasn't really hungry. He was lying. He wanted alcohol or drugs. I'm, 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 I'm making sense to you right now. And so God does not want his people... And, and listen, if I'm going to teach, I'm going to teach. But God don't want his people supporting dope and drug addicts and alcohol addicts. It doesn't matter if they're your grandchildren or your children or your cousin or your brother. Because you're not helping them. You're helping destroy them. You're giving them one more hit. One more night with drugs. One more night with the frogs. And one of those nights is going to be their last night. And you're going to feel real bad if it was your $100 bill that killed them. When they OD, if you're the one that gave them the money. You don't be able to live with yourself. Well...
And how can God bless the rest of your parts? How can God bless the rest of your finances? See, the whole, the whole thing is you've got to realize it's not, it, it, again, again, hey, hey, ever, everybody hear me. How would y'all feel if you found out that you're paying your tithes and offerings into this church and you found out I was giving money to someone that was a known crystal meth head? How would you feel about that? You know what you'd say? You don't have the right to give God's money to somebody that's on drugs. Well, then we better go back to lesson two. Because what you're handling, you're just a steward of what's God's. So why is it all right for you to give God's money? But it's not okay for me to. If you want to be blessed, and you want to be blessed abundantly, then you've got to decide who the poor is. Man, I'm all for, I am all for helping someone. You know, the, these, these, we, we, we've got uh, young people in this church all the time that get between jobs or they get in a mess. They, you know, they, because of childishness, they overextend themselves. And they come to my office crying, and I, I, I've overextended myself. I didn't mean to, but. But here I am, and they're, they're learning life. And if they're willing to go, go through the Dave Ramsey program and get with an adult in this church and get some supervision to walk out of their financial mess, I'm willing to help them get out of their situation. Now, if they do that three more times, then I know that no longer do I classify them as the poor. They're now beginning the life of a con artist. You see, a con artist ain't just the slick, smooth guy down on the, down on the street corner somewhere that's trying to con you. A con artist is somebody that continues to try to live above their means. And they don't mind who they, it don't matter to them who they got to borrow from and who they leave unpaid as long as they get what they want. There's all different types and stripes of con artists. If you don't pay your bills and you knowingly leave, leave people unpaid while you continue to buy stuff, And then you wonder, well, why, why isn't God blessing me? Why am I struggling? Why am I getting in these messes? I'm not smart, but I'd like to weigh in on that one. God's not going to bless that. Well, I, boy, I didn't realize part three was going to get this rough. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, that God only blesses honesty and integrity and righteousness. And the poor is someone that unwittingly, unknowingly, or through an accident or through a situation, I'll tell you who the poor is. The poor is the guy that was robbed and beat and left in a ditch to die. He was an innocent bystander that had everything he had taken from him. And he was stripped and wounded and beaten. And you know what God did? God rewarded the good Samaritan that stepped in and said, Take him and heal him and, and whatever he needs, supply it and I will repay. But God's not going to bless someone that knowingly lives beyond their means to the point that they can't pay the debt that they already have. God will take his hands off that. He will not bless that. Hallelujah. So I'm, I'm, I'm done. You're smart enough to get it, but you've got to decide who the poor is. And the poor is not someone that has chosen a lifestyle. 
The poor is someone that is having a temporary circumstance that they need to get through. And you help them get through it. I also believe that our veterans that went off and lost limbs and lost their mind and Hallelujah. You know what I think we need to do? You know what I think the government needs to do and the United States of America needs to do? We need to step up. We need to join together. That is the poor. Someone that through no fault of their own worked a job uh, that, that did not have benefits and got elderly and literally does not have the ability to take care of themselves because of a fall or because they're in a wheelchair. That's the poor. You know what we ought to do? We ought to step in and make sure that person has a place to live and a roof over their head and meals to eat. They didn't get there through drugs or alcohol or an ungodly lifestyle. Am I making sense to you? And so we, we've, got, we've got to decide. And, and all that is is deciding what ground you're going to sow your seed in. Because if I, if I sow seed giving to the poor of someone that has a chosen lifestyle that I'm supporting tobacco and cigarettes and alcohol and all that stuff, then I'm not going to get a return on that investment. That's, like, that's not like, like me planting seed in the Sahara Desert. But if I find a, a Vietnam vet, am I making sense to you right now? I find a Vietnam vet that, that's suffering from uh, post-traumatic syndrome and, and Agent Orange and, and lost a leg and is in a wheelchair. And I say, you know what? Uh, uh, for, for, the, for the rest of your life, I'm going to pay your light bill for you. I can't afford to completely support you, but we're going to get together and I'm going to do that part. And if someone else will help you in other ways, then we can get you through. Then I believe that I've planted my seed now in good ground that's going to bring a return. It's something God can bless. It's important where you put your seed. You would not go out there and plant your seed in ground that you knew didn't have the nutrients in it to bring back a return. You'd be foolish to go out there and say, you know, I've planted in this spot for, for, uh, for four years and I've never got anything back out of that. You know what I would say? You ought to have better sense than that. You don't plant your seed there. Hallelujah. God is a capitalist, he's not a socialist. All right, I need three guys to help me right quick. I need three guys to help me right quick. I just, uh, each one of y'all go stand at the top of one of those ropes. I just read to you the, the parable of the talents. And it's hard for us to understand the parable of the talents. And so we're going to act out the parable of the talents tonight. But we're going to do it as a river instead of talents and ground. So this first man, and we're going to do it backwards. God starts with the one that was given five and goes to two and one. We're going to start the opposite way. We're going to start over here on the left with the guy that has one talent, and he takes his talent and buries it because he's scared of God. The, the core of the talent, and, and uh, of the story of the talents, and Brother Treadway Elsie Treadway said it beautifully Sunday, uh, is tr really the view of the Father. It's the view of the Master. Really, the, the, the one that had one talent had a wrong view of his Master. That was his problem. He viewed his Master as a mean man, a harsh man. So, Instead of talents, we're going to talk about the fact that, that all, of, all, all of this back here, this platform back here, we're going to imagine that, that this, is, um, this is the Arctic. 
And so this is all frozen snow that melts. Are y'all with me? This is all frozen snow and ice. And it goes for, from, for thousands of miles of snow and ice. And there's three rivers that come off of that snowbank. This is a river coming off the snowbank, this is a river coming off the snowbank, and this is a river coming off the snowbank. And each one of these rivers has a man that lives at the head of it. And this man lives at the head of the river, and he looks up there, and from him, his perspective, it doesn't look like there's a whole lot of snow. And he thinks to himself, what if one day all the snow is melted and there's no more water? So instead of letting the river, this is the river, it's yellow. You must have a lot of cattle. <clears throat> so what he does is he dams up his river. That ladder's a dam. He dams up his river and he turns it into a big lake. That way he and his family will have plenty. And he looks down there to everybody that lives down at the bottom of his river and says, I hope they figure out a way to make it. And if there's any extra that flows down, my lake just gets bigger. And you know what? Me and my family, we just get to flourish more. And they'll, they'll work something out down there, I'm sure. And that's the man with one talent. He dams it up. He hides it to make sure that he keeps what he's got. Because the God that's supplying may not have enough. And one day it may run out. But at least we'll have plenty for a while if it does. The second man is the man in our story that has two talents. But we're going to again use the river. And what he says is, it looks like there's plenty of snow up there and there's going to be plenty of water. So I'm not going to do anything to the river and I'm going to let it keep flowing. And me or my family are going to use all we can at the head and whatever trickles out, man, if they can use it down there, it'll be a blessing to them. But we're not going to do anything to open the river up. We're not going to do anything to expand the supply. We're going to get what we can get out of it and if more flows down, I may, I mean, if we just, one year, we just get an abundant flow, I may put in a swimming pool and let my kids swim. But we're not going to make sure any more goes out the end. We're going to take all we can get because there's a lot of things we can do with extra water. And whatever trickles out, if that can be a blessing to someone, so be it. And so this man has a very limited view of the God that supplies. This man feels like the God that supplies is pretty abundant, but, you know, why should he bless me? And if he does, I'll utilize it. If he don't, well, I'll figure out a way to live on what comes. But we've got another guy over here, and he's the one with five, ta with five talents. And he says, you know what? I've surveyed this thing, and it looks like there's so much snow and ice up there that I could live 16 lifetimes and never use up all that's there. So i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to hire a guy with a track hoe, and we're going to get in here, and we're going to open this river up. We're going to widen this thing to where way more snow can come down, melt and come down, than comes down naturally. We're going to widen it. We're going to broaden it. We're going to get this thing flowing to where so much is coming down that anything that we can dream of will be supplied. We can put in swimming pools. We can put in reservoirs. We can put in run water in everybody's houses, bring those ropes. And not only that, but we're going to get down here where all these people live. I know there's several people down here. 
We're going to bring a bulldozer and a track hoe down here, and we're going to open it up, and we're going to make sure all this water that's flowing down here feeds everybody's farm down here. We're going to be, we're going to be a blessing because we're blessed. We're going to be a blessing to everyone downstream from us. And so we're going to open it up. I know there's the, the, the man, the, 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 there's a family that lives over here. They need water to their farm. There's several families down here that needs water to their farm. There, there's a, uh, what about the Williams over here? Can we get, is there any way we can get water over to here to him? Bring that track co over here. And do, the, the Williams, they've been struggling. They've been struggling with a drought, but we're going to bring a river right over there to their farm. We need one over here to the Joneses. Man, man, there's plenty to go. We got a God that's an abundant God. There's plenty of water. Open that thing up and let it flow. And the widest part of it goes by our house anyway. So we're going to have all we need while supplying everybody else with all that they need. Let me ask you something. Which river would you like to live on? Choose a river. Choose a river. You want to you live on not enough? Just enough? Or more than enough? Because the God that I serve has infinite supply. There is no struggle to all that he has. And depending on how your river flows is absolutely dependent on how you view your God. If you view your God as a God of infinite supply, you're going to get the track coes and the bulldozers in and say, open that thing up and let her flow. Now here's what God said. Here's what Jesus said. This is red letter in your Bible. He comes back and he looks at what everyone's done with their river. He says, I'm sorry, man, but you don't have a river no more. You damn that thing up and all you was worried about is yourself and you hit it and you had a wrong view of your God. I'm taking your river and you come over here. You're going to work from here and from now on. He's got a lot better view of how I operate. He's your servant. There's his river. Do something with it. Am I out of the book? And each one is just simply because they have a different view of the river. Years ago, when I came here to pastor, I started preaching because when, when, when I got here, and I'm not, I'm not throwing off on, on anybody. It's just that I came in and God sent me here. And I had a view of some things because I'd been some places. And, and, and at that time, the, the offering was, I, I don't know, it may be six, eight hundred. I'm sorry. The whole income of the church was anywhere from four to eight hundred dollars a week, depending on what week it was. There were some weeks that it was $400 a week. There were some weeks it was $600 a week. And then there was weeks that people got paid monthly and bi-weekly. And when that fell together, you'd have weeks where there's $800 a week. I liked them $800 a week weeks. Sure made things better. Since we had a van note and we had a gym note, and Sister Copeland and I had a new baby and we was trying to survive. But I got to noticing that the offering was only about 1% of the tithing because people had not been taught. They may pay $80 a week in tithing and give a $5 offering. And so I started preaching that your, your offering ought to at least be 5% of your tithing. And man, when the people started doing that, they started being blessed. You know, you, you'd have thought it would have been the opposite of that. You'd have thought when they started doing that, they was going to have to readjust and start fixing things and, 
Well, I, you know, I, I started really supporting the church, and Brother Copeland said it ought to be at least 5% of my, my uh, tithe, and, and so, I, you know, I'm going to have to sell my four-wheeler. But that's not what happened. The people that did that, at the end of the year, some of them came to me and of their own design said, we're going to 10 and 10. We got such a good response from God by, by upping our offering. And so a huge swath of this church that's been with us for years, and I don't teach this all the time because I don't teach on money all the time, does 10 and 10. They've done 10 and 10 for years. I've had them for one year say, this year I'm going to do 10 and 15. I'm literally going to give 15% offerings on top of 10% tithing. The, these are the most blessed people in this church because giving has got to be cheerful. If it's out of obligation, then it's no wonder you don't get a return because you feel obligated, and so you're doing it not out of a cheerful heart, but out of a feeling of obligation, and it's the same as not doing it at all. Am I, am I making sense to you right now? Now, I, I, I want to talk about the fact that the Biden administration, since they've gotten in, and this isn't a throw off on the Biden administration because it could just as easily be a Republican. It just so happens that right now we're under the Biden administration. So if you're in a Democrat, I'm not trying to offend you tonight. But my point is, is that they've made it very difficult for people to give. What they've done is they, they, they've passed laws to where if you give to your church, you can't even hardly claim a return on it, a, a, a tax exemption. And, and so uh, people who are fearful, it makes them fearful to give. But let me just tell you this. The United States of America is about the only country on earth that gives any benefit for, for giving to charity. But guess what? Everybody in all these other countries, they pay their tithes and give offerings too. They just don't get a tax write-off. You've got to decide as we move closer to a non-Christian nation that my giving is not so I'll be tax-free or tax-exempt. My giving because, is because it was the right thing to do and it was good while it lasted. If you're giving for a tax write-off, you're not giving for the right reason. The right reason has got to be that the gospel goes forward. If I get a tax write off, that's good, but that's not going to stop me from giving to the kingdom of God. All those people in the all those people in the Bible, bear with me just a minute, guys. We're almost done. All those people in the Bible that brought gifts to the to the tabernacle until finally the priest stood up and said, Don't bring any more. Not only do we not have a place to put it, but we got way more than we need. Didn't get one tax right off. I promise you, when in the book of Acts, when, when they, they brought all of their stuff to the, to, the, to the feet of the apostles and disciples, and said, so take it and distribute it and do with it. Well, uh, bless the church, how the church needs to be blessed. I promise you, Rome wasn't giving any of them a tax write-off. They were Roman citizens. They were Christians in Rome, and Rome was putting up with the fact that they was there as long as they behaved themselves. They didn't get one tax write-off. But in the middle of that, God blessed them so that Ananias and Sapphira had investment property. See, we don't like all that. We like all that. They were all poor and they all didn't have anything. Well, then what did they bring? What 
they bring the feet of Jesus? And when Ananias and Sapphira said, we got some investment property over here, and when we sell that investment property, we're going to give the whole of it to the church. When they came and said, well, we, decide, we changed our mind, we decided to just give part of it. The man of God didn't say, well, you know, y'all are poor. Why don't you just keep it all? It's, it's all okay. It's all forgiven. That's not what happened. He said, you've lied to the Holy Ghost, and they dropped dead. You know why? Because they weren't given out of need. They were given out of abundance. They were rich, and they decided to keep their riches. Because it's just like the man of God preached Sunday. Had they been poor, and had they been giving their kids lunches away, the man of God would have done just what Brother Treadway did Sunday and said, hey, we forgive all that. You had good intentions, but you, you tried to give beyond your ability. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, 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 you listen to me. If Joseph can become second in command from a prison, and if Daniel... Can, if Daniel can become second in command as a captive from a country that's been taken over, a pilgrim and a stranger in his country. And I can go on and on and on with it. If Abraham can sojourn into foreign lands and become the wealthiest man in the world while sojourning in foreign lands then it doesn't matter how anti-Christian America becomes. It doesn't matter if they take away our tax benefits. It... If you will get in there in faith in a God that has plenty for you to prosper and take you some bulldozers and some track hoes and open up the river and say, I'm not going to dam it up. The more that flows, the more I'm going to bless the people around me. God, you can trust me. If you'll bless me, I will be a blessing to others downstream from me. There is enough in the, there's enough in the mountains to supply all that's needed. You can be seated. I'm done. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. I got one question. Have I made a lick of sense to any of you tonight? The blessing or the lack of favor is in how you decide to view God. And somebody said, well, Brother Copeland, I've struggled. I've struggled. I'm working two jobs and struggling. You took that second job because you think you're the one in, in command. You took that second job because you thought you were the one that brings prosperity. I'm not saying it's a sin to work a second job, but before you do that, you better ask God, what role do you want me to play here? We have way too much faith and confidence in our own selves and our own ingenuity. And it comes from a... It, it comes from a, a, a listen, listen to me. I don't mean to offend you. But, but it, it, it comes from a poor man's mentality. It comes from poverty thinking. It's poverty thinking. When are you going to look at heaven and say, Now, God, I've given, and I've been liberal, and I've loved you, and I've loved your kingdom. And I'm not saying all that to make you think that you've got to bless me out of obligation. Because you didn't need mine before I ever gave it. But you did make some promises. And I stand on those promises. And I don't need to be working a second job. I need to be home with my wife and kids. Because you gave me beautiful children. 
And I'm in, a, I'm in an obligation not to have them out running the streets on a Friday night or Thursday night or Wednesday night or whenever it is. But my obligation is to be home and require them to be home with their daddy. I need to provide a home. You gave them to me. I need to provide a home to them. And so if you tell me to go out and get a second job then I'll do it. But that's not the first thing I'm going to do. The first thing I'm going to do is tell you I'm a tithe payer. And I'm an offering giver. And I'm a worshiper. And I'm an aisle runner. And you're not obligated to me because I'm a worshiper. But you did make some promises to the worshipers. And I'm cashing in right now on the promises that you made. And I believe that you are a God that can give me more than enough. And so before I go out there on some kind of a, of a poverty mentality and get me a second job making pennies, I'm going to get my spiritual bulldozer out and I'm going to start opening my river up. And I'm going to say, let her flow, God. Let her flow, God. Let her flow. Stand together. God wants to work some miracles right now. God wants to work some miracles right now. You still didn't hear me. God wants to work some miracles right now. Somebody back there somewhere where you were growing up or where you were going to church gave you a wrong view of God. He is an abundant God. He has got abundant blessings. He's got more than enough. And he, it is His will for you to prosper. I still, I still don't feel the faith in this house I want to feel. Some of you still hadn't made the switch over. You still think, well, I got to work harder and I got to work more hours and I got to put. I, I, I don't know how many people's lost their children because they're working too many jobs. I don't know how many people's lost their children because they're working too many jobs. Somebody said, Brother Copeland, it seemed like you'd want me to work two jobs. That's more tithes and offerings for you. I don't need it that bad. I want to see families come in here happy. Not marriage is boast, busted up because daddy's trying to work three jobs and never at home. I'm telling you, God is an abundant God with abundant supply. He has got more than enough. And your problem is not that you need a second job. Your problem is that you need to change your view of the God that you serve. Somebody said, well, you started this out talking about God wouldn't bless somebody that's lazy. There's a, whole, there's a big difference in laziness and working to the point that you're not there for your kids. There's a big difference. And, 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 and when, you, when you put your family in peril after you've already worked 40 hours a week, and you put your family in peril then you think you're the supplier. You've got to change your view of God. God is the supplier. And God knows how to open channels if you would give it to Him. Somebody said, I did pray about it. How did you pray about it? Did you whine about it? We gotta quit making our 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 prayers poor pitiful feel sorry for me sessions. A, a poor pitiful me is a prayer prayed in doubt. And prayers prayed in doubt do not bring results. It's when you That's why the Bible said, Come boldly before the throne of grace.
it's time for you to step in his throne room, fall down to your knees and say, now God, I've done everything I can to obey your word. I am a worshiper. I am sold out to your kingdom. I'm one of your zealots. I'm one of your soldiers. I believe in you. You didn't give me children to leave them at home alone. You didn't give me a family to abandon them. Oh my God, have mercy. You gave me children for me to teach them and raise them. And it's up to me to show them a God that is sufficient. And if you can multiply a little boy's lunch to feed 20,000, you can sure... If you can multiply a little boy's lunch to feed 20,000, you can sure take care of me and mine. Now, 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 you you know, if you'd rather work two, three jobs and and all that, well, you just go ahead. But I'm going to tell you what I'd do. I'd be willing to make myself a fool for Christ. I'd come up here when nobody's around, and I'd get to pull in levers. I'd say, you know what I'm doing, God? I'm opening that river up. It's time for your prosperity to flow. I'm getting up here with my spiritual bulldozer, and I'm opening this thing up, and I won't dam it up at the other end. If you'd like to use me to bless others, pour it on, God. But I'm changing my view of you. You are a God that is more than enough. And you know I'm not lazy. And you know I'm willing to work. But I'm ready for you to put my confidence in you. I'm telling you the reason we're living beneath our means is because we have not decided what kind of God we serve. And, and, and we came out, we came out of a, a generation. We came out of a generation that, that felt like we ought to sit around the dinner table and pray for somebody to bring us a chicken. And we heard all the stories of how they sit around, they, they, they brought sacks of groceries to, to people. Well, let me just tell you, there's two ways to look at that. You can be the one receiving the sack of groceries. Or you can be the one delivering the sack of groceries. I want to be bringing sacks of groceries, not getting sacks of groceries. And it's all dependent on how you view God. If you view God as somebody that can bring you just enough for another meal, or you bring God that can pour out so much that you have enough to sack it up and bring it to the neighbor's. It's all dependent on how you view God. And let me tell you something. You say, well, Brother Copeland, that was men like Joe Duke, and that was men like like, uh, uh, Hiram Holland, and that, that, that was powerful men of God. Let me tell you something. Powerful men of God can have wrong views of God too. And as we move into each generation, we ought to ask God to give us a greater view of what He is. To view God as a God that all He can do is bring you a can of beans and a chicken, and that's the wrong view of God, is the same thing as saying because some of these elders believed in a trinity, then I'm going to believe in a trinity. Somewhere we got to say, well, God, if you show me more, I'll walk into it. And God has shown us more. And He's shown us that we don't have to be delivered chickens. We can be the ones delivering the chickens. And I'm going to walk in it. And I'm not going to dam my river up and make it a lake. And I'm not going to take all I can get and then hope some trickles out for somebody else. I'm getting in the track hose and the dirt moving equipment and I'm opening my river up and I'm hoping that it feeds thousands. I'm hoping that it supplies water to thousands. Thousands. 
I'm going to say it one more time. God came to perform a miracle for you tonight. But you got to believe it. You got to believe it. Brother Treadway brought a thousand dollar offering here and said, I want, I want to start the offering for that new building. He said, it's time to build. I want to start the offering. Well, guess what happened? Somebody caught hold of that. And this man came to me and blew my mind the other night with the offering that he brought for that new building. He said, Brother Treadway might have got the first one, but I'm getting the second one. I might not be able to be the first, but I can be the second. You know what he did? He took that backhoe up. He just opened that, he just opened that thing up. The church is not in trouble. And it doesn't matter what happens in Washington, the church is not going to be in trouble. And it doesn't matter what the government does, the church is not going to be in trouble. God is going to figure out a way to supply a church. I'm making this one disclaimer, and that's going to be it. But he's not going to bless churches that are sitting around with their dam up. I, I, I preach for churches that had a quarter of a million, half a million, 750000 a million dollars in a bank account somewhere. And they weren't planning on building, and they weren't planning on expanding. Setting on hundreds of thousands of dollars and had them a bank board guarding it and bragging about oh, our church. Boy, we got, man, we got uh, $300,000 in the... Now, let me tell you, I'm not trying to scare you, but we ain't got 30000 right now. Because I told y'all when I took this church, my goal was going to be to keep it broke. Because we're not doing the work of God setting on hundreds of thousands of dollars. We're doing the work of God when we're building buildings in other cities. And we're starting daughter works. And we're building churches in Brazil. And we're building churches in Africa. And we're digging wells in Africa where they don't have water for their children. This church gave, I, I, I can't remember what it was now, but it was tens of thousands of dollars to producing of Bibles in several different languages so that they could be handed out in foreign countries that did not have Bibles to read. And I think we sent 10,000 Bibles to Africa alone to where the people of that African nation could read the Bible in their own language. That is opening the river. That is opening the flow. Now I'm done and it's 9 o'clock. But there's many of you standing here right now who are struggling in your personal finances. And I'm not here tonight to get an offering from you. I'm here tonight to change your view of God. And for you to tell God, I'm tired of having a damn up mentality to make sure. Boy, that almost sounded like I cussed, didn't it? Man, I hope they don't clip that off the live stream. That's what the fish said when he ran in that concrete wall. So, I refuse, I refuse to down the flow up. And say, I can't, I can't afford to give. I can't afford to flow. I Man, one of these days, if you ever bless me, God, I'm, I'm going to really flow. You're viewing it as yours. What you got to do is you got to get over there and open that thing up and say, God, I'm living, I am living under an open heaven. I'm living under a God that has the ability to bless. 
And it's not the will of God for me to struggle. And it's not the will of God for me to face these situations. I'm in, ending with an illustration. When I came here to pastor this church through ignorance on my own part, I'd ended up with 1099s from churches. And uh, I didn't have enough sense to know what a 1099 was or how it worked. And I ended up with, with, with the, the fees that they tacked on and all that, about a $20,000 tax bill when I took this church. And I began to pray about that. And, and back then, it, it might, have, might as well have been a quarter of a million. And I got to praying about that, and I got to seeking God about that. Now listen, as God is my witness, are you listening to me right now? I got with a tax guy, and he said, I'm going to help you, preacher. And he helped me go back to the years that I'd helped me add up all the miles that I'd traveled, the meals I'd eat, ate, ate and while I was on the road, and all, all that through the years that they were going back on, which was about four or five years. Now, you listen to me. Through those years, I didn't pay taxes because I didn't make enough money to pay any taxes. And when he got done, they mailed me a check. When he got done, they mailed me a check. Do you understand how big that is? And I'm telling you, God is ready to make work some miracles for some of you like that. But you, you're not going to get it by damning things up and hoping that you can survive and all that. You're going to get it when you start viewing God. It's not as much what you do right now. It's what you do later. Right now what I'm working on is your view of God. You have got to view God as a God with enough supply and enough provision that if you could believe in Him, that He could flow enough into your world. And you wouldn't have to go rob a bank or take three jobs to do it. Because again, when you start that stuff, you're putting confidence in you. Now, I don't mean don't work. I don't mean for some of y'all to go, I'm just going to go home and sit down and wait on God to supply. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a balance point. A 40-hour-a-week work week away from your family is enough. If you got a spouse and kids, God gave them to you for you to be with them. Why are you preaching like this? Because the tighter it gets, the more I hear guys going offshore and guys taking extra jobs and women taking extra jobs. That's not the will of God. That is fear. That is fear. Confidence in God says, I'm working hard, I'm giving the best, i got a family to be here with, and God, you're going to have to figure out a way. If it all belongs to you, you're going to have to figure out a way to take care of my stuff. God can do it. He can give you something. He can give you an idea. He can work something out. He can fix it, and he wants to work a miracle for some people in this house right now. Would you throw your hands in there and believe? Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. That's it. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on right now. God, you prove to these people what you are. Come on. God, you show yourself to these people right now. My God. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. Come on, Holy Ghost. You show yourself to these people right now. We live under an open heaven. We live under an open heaven. We live under an open heaven. 
I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, for 25 years of pastor in this church, I've never kept an abundance of money in the bank. Every time that account built up, I sent money to missionaries. Every time that account built up, I brought evangelists in here and paid them. I've bought them travel trailers. I've sent them on vacations. I've, I've, I've had, had uh, stuff fixed on their travel trailers. I've had washers and dryers installed install in their travel trailers. I've, I've, we've dug wells in other countries, built buildings in other countries. Whatever we could do to make sure the kingdom of God was preached. The, the, the kingdom of God the Word of God was preached and the kingdom of God was expanded. And never one time have we gotten into trouble. There's always been more than enough. There's always been more than enough. You know why? Because I never viewed this as my church or my money. I never viewed this as something that was deserved me or owed me. And when you decide that your life and your family, that you're a, you're a child of God, and He's your abundant Father, then it's up to Him. You know, that's, that's the way it was. I'm done, but that's the way it was when I was a kid at home. You know, I'd hear Mom and Dad talk from time to time and talk about bills and talk about paying things and Man, I went out in the yard and swung on the swing. That, that wasn't my problem. I mean, if there's enough peanut butter and jelly and bread in the cabinet, I mean, I, that's all I was worried about. That was not my problem as a child. I would have been a warped child if I'd have been out there in the swing. We can't pay our bills. The greatest compliment I could pay my father it's just go out there and rip and run in the yard and say, Daddy, figure it out. I got a good daddy. Man, let me just tell you something. I was raised in that house, well, 25 years, because I didn't get married until I was older. Our electricity never got turned off one time. Our water never got turned off. Not once. They never turned the gas off. There was never an eviction notice put on our door. Never once. And if that happened to you, I'm not trying to make you feel bad about yourself. I'm just simply saying that Daddy figured it out. I don't know how he did it because we weren't rich, but he figured it out. We took a vacation every year. And we weren't rich and didn't have, enough, have a lot of money. I know that looking back. Because I remember the potted meat and the sandwich bread on the picnic tables and the Shasta drinks on the way up there. I was very familiar with potted meat and Shasta. If you ate potted meat and Shasta, you were not rich. <laughs> Especially if you did it at a picnic table. And if you ever stayed five people in one hotel room with two beds, and you had to turn the vent fan on to the bathroom so that the hot plate wouldn't set off the fire alarm, because you couldn't afford to eat in restaurants, but buddy, you was on vacation. You weren't rich. I might start my own book, You Weren't Rich If. I'm not trying to keep you here all night. All I'm trying to tell you is I didn't worry because I had a good father. And the greatest insult I could have paid my dad is to be in the room and say, I need shoes, Daddy. I don't know where my shoes are going to come from. i got to have shoes. You know, if he found me crying in the middle of the night because I wondered where my lunch money was going to come from the next day, he'd have said, he, you know what he'd have said? Who do you think I am? You are insulting me.
Your problem is not a prosperity problem. Your problem is a view of God problem. You know what he said? He said, consider the lilies of the field. They don't worry about what they're going to wear. Consider the sparrow. They don't worry about what they're going to eat. You quit worrying and open that thing up. Oh, go ahead, Brother Eric. Open that river up. Get you a view of God. We serve an abundant God. I'm done. Somebody lift your hands and put confidence in Jesus Christ. Put your business in his hands. Put your finances in his hands. Put your children and your family in his hands. Come on, somebody.